Now, if you've been reading um, ahead um, in the book of Revelation, you will have seen that, um, you know, that we, we're in for some very interesting times in our study of this book. Now, so far, the book has been you know, relatively easy to understand. Um, the first three chapters uh, in particular were probably the easiest of the whole book to understand um, uh, with you know, Jesus speaking his mind concerning his churches, uh, his seven churches, which of course represent, I believe, the church throughout history. And so uh, everything that he said to those churches in one way or another have applied to uh, churches throughout history. In chapter 4, we got a glimpse of what um, the throne room um, of God in heaven looks like. And then in chapter 5, we see the Lord Jesus worshipped by all in heaven, including the four strange living creatures and, and millions of angels. In chapter 6, we see that Jesus is the only worthy person to open the scroll of destiny. And so God gave him the scroll, and then he starts breaking each of the seven seals that protected the scroll. The first four seals release the, uh, the four horse riders that represent that, that initial impact of the Antichrist upon the earth. And then after that, as each seal um, <clears throat> is revealed, we see more and more calamity being unleashed on earth as the judgment of God begins to fall on the sinful people who have rejected Jesus. Chapter 7 showed us 144,000 uh, Jewish um, evangelists being saved and, and set aside to proclaim the gospel during these end times. And we also saw a great multitude of people in heaven that had come out of the tribulation period uh, who were just too numerous for, for the Apostle John to even estimate their number. I believe this great multitude of people are those casual or uh, are made up of those casual or, or nominal Christians that uh, didn't um, make it in the rapture. In addition to these are all of those who got saved after realizing that Jesus was in fact who he had always said that he was. You know, husbands or wives of Christians who had always rejected what their spouse was saying or what their parents were saying or what their kids were saying to them about Jesus. And then suddenly they find themselves on their own because their loved ones are suddenly gone and they realize, oh my gosh, my wife, my husband, my kids, my parents were right all along. And so now they're confronted with this reality and they become Christians. And then on top of that, the, this multitude is also made up of all of those people that the 144,000 uh, Jewish evangelists reached throughout the world. And, um, and so from what we can tell, you know, the great multitude of people will become saved after the tribulation. And I think, uh, sorry, uh, during the tribulation and after the rapture. And I think this is why uh, it can be confusing when we're reading some of the, the, the passages of the book to determine, well, hang on a minute, how can the rapture happen when there's clearly Christians in the tribulation? Well, yes, there will be Christians during the tribulation, but I believe that those born again, full on, living for Jesus, not just those who call themselves Christians, but those who are known by the way that they live, I believe those will be raptured. And so I think that's why it's, it's confusing um, and, and my own views were that the Christians would be here through the rapture, uh, but I believe that, um, that I no longer believe that. I believe that those who are full-on living for Jesus Christ, um, not just by name, but by, in fact, their lifestyles will be raptured. And so, as Ryan said this morning, uh, we have reason to be grateful, and we should certainly be, re uh, we should certainly be grateful that we won't be here to... Um, to see and witness and experience the wrath of God being unleashed on a world that hates Him. Um, now we covered uh, all of this, um, the, the, these last seven chapters in, I guess, 19 messages. And if you're visiting with us today and um, you haven't been here for, or you haven't been here for all the messages, then uh, we do post them on our YouTube channel and you can watch them there. Now, as we enter into chapter 8, um, we see that all of a sudden heaven just goes silent. No singing, no talking, just complete silence. Why was this? What was about to happen that had all of heaven go dead silent? Well, what happens is that Jesus opens or breaks the seventh seal 
uh, the last seal on the scroll of destiny, and all of heaven seems to hold their breath, waiting to see what happens next. So let's go to chapter 8, verse 1 and 2. When the Lamb broke the seventh seal on the scroll, there was silence throughout heaven for about half an hour. I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and they were given seven trumpets. Now, when the seventh seal gets broken, um, the seven angels um, you know, step up, and, and they're given these seven trumpets uh, that will signal the seven judgments to be unleashed upon the earth. Now, if you think that things have been bad... Uh, and horrible so far, well, yes, I agree that they have been, but it seems that the worst is yet to come. Getting through parts of this book will feel like hard going. I get that. And, uh, and I'm just so glad that, that, uh, that, that God has promised that uh, whoever preaches this book and whoever hears and listens to this book uh, will be blessed, uh, because otherwise it would be tempting to just move on to easier books to preach from. But I'm believing that this church will be blessed if we continue. And I know it's hard going. You know, I get that. It's really hard to preach an encouraging word when it's just all doom and gloom. But we can be grateful that this doom and gloom is not for us. We've got to remember that, that th this is God unleashing His judgment on those who have hated Him, those who have scorned Him, those who have mistreated Him. It's not for us. It's not for His people. Amen? Amen. Um, so, as we navigate through, you know, all of this pain and, and drama that we'll be reading about, then let's just remember to be grateful. To be grateful for God. To be grateful that He found a way for us to escape all of this. Because you know what? With the exception of our belief in God and our commitment to serve Him, we're not all that different from everyone else out there. Yeah. True? Yeah. Amen. Uh, so today we're going to look at what happens um, when the first four angels sound their trumpets. And as we do, we will see that things go from bad to worse for those who will be living on earth during this great tribulation. Now John describes the scene um, that, uh, that must be um, a first in heaven, you know, a first happening in heaven, uh, and that is total silence for a whole half hour. I mean, chapters 4 and 5 and 7 uh, all describe heaven as a place of worship and praise and joy and corporate singing. Uh, heaven is described as a place alive with noise. Uh, it's pictured as a place that literally throbs with the excitement of its inhabitants. And yet we're told that there's dead silence in that land of praise for a whole half hour. The four beasts and elders are silent. The angels and the redeeming multitudes have neither shouts nor praise of songs or uh, nothing that they offer up like that. Uh, there's no divine pronouncements from the throne. Heaven sits in total science, uh, silence. And you've got to remember that we're talking millions of angels. I mean, have you ever been in a crowd and everybody was dead silent? Now, someone always says something. But no, total silence for a half hour in heaven. You know, silence can be a powerful thing. You can be um, just about asleep in a, servant, uh, in a service, as you know, some of you sometimes do, even with your eyes open, I know. <laughs> but uh, just let the preacher fall silent, and you're going to snap to attention. Yeah. Silence can also be kind of nerve-shattering. I mean, imagine you've just asked your girlfriend if she'll marry you, and then she sits there in silence for 30 minutes. <laughs> Not a good sign, is it? Here on earth, we often see people call for a moment of silence in the aftermath of tragic events and then sometimes on their anniversaries. In this case, it seems heaven calls for a moment of silence before the coming tragic event. What calamity is the first trumpet about to signal? But before any of the seven angels with the trumpets do anything, another angel steps in into play, and something very interesting happens. Let's read the next two verses. Then another angel with a gold incense burner came and stood at the altar, and a great amount of incense was given to him to mix with the prayers of God's people as an offering on the gold altar before the throne. The smoke of the incense mixed with the prayers of God's holy people ascended up to God from the altar where the angel had poured them out. Now, 
You know, mixing incense with prayers of God's people is kind of intriguing, to say the least. Most of us will testify that, you know, in our prayer life, there have been times when our prayers are answered almost instantly. You know, a bit like what happened to, 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 to Mark over just 15 hours. Something that could have been absolutely tragic, and here he was this morning as if nothing had happened. Praise God. And of course, others, um, uh, they, they can take a long time to be answered. And then with some of our prayers, they may never have been answered. Which may leave some of us wondering if our incense angel has not been doing his job. You know, and taking our prayers to the Lord when we need him to. Now, then there's also the case of the, um, you know, the Cornelius, a Roman um, centurion, um, you know, whose prayers it seems one day just suddenly... Uh, came to God's attention. And we read about this in Acts 10, verse 3 and 4. One afternoon, about 3 o'clock, uh, he, speaking of Cornelius, had a vision in which he saw an angel of God coming towards him. Cornelius, the angel said. Cornelius stared at him in terror, as you would. Um, what is it, sir? He asked the angel. And the angel replied, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have been received by God as an offering. Now, both passages speak of prayers being regarded as an offering before God. There seems to be a relationship between incense and prayers that, of course, Jewish people will understand more than we do. Traditionally, for the Orthodox Jews, prayers uh, were uh, something that they offered up while the priest was in the temple burning incense. Now, the smoke and the aroma of the incense would then ascend into the presence of God and uh, in, in that most holy place in the temple, uh, and it seems it would be accepted by God as an offering. Now, John's vision gives us some understanding of the nature of prayer. You know, for too many Christians, prayer is either a shopping list of things that we want God to give us, or it's a, a kind of heavenly uh, triple zero um, call for rescue, or... Um, uh, what is it, uh, 917 or 911 if you're in America, um, you know, a call out for a rescue in a moment of need or trouble or some kind of difficulty. And that, that seems to, you know, amount for the great majority of prayers that God hears. But the truth is that, that prayer is not something that's viewed by most Christians as, as something that we do. It's, it's rarely seen as something that we're a part of, that it's just part of our life. You know, those of you here must live with someone. I mean, you might live alone, but, you know, most of you probably live with someone. Well, you communicate with those people, don't you? I mean, they are part of your life. Communicating with them is part of your life. It's not something that you do. It's just instinctive. And I think the kind of relationship that God wants with his people is the same. You know, he wants us to instinctively just interact with him that way. And I believe the sooner that we understand that, that God is actually not obligated to answer any of our prayers, then I think the better that we will understand how to pray. God is not like some puppet servant on uh, the end of our prayer strings obligated to do what we want him to do. God usually only answers our prayers when we pray them with genuine faith and when he can agree uh, that our prayers are indeed answerable because they are in line with his will for us or for those for whom we are praying. How many of you know that you can pray for someone and it's not God's will? You know, you could be praying for your son. Lord, he's 35 years old. He needs a wife. You know, Lord, send him a wife. Good looking, <laughs> tall, blonde, you know, good stock. With a family with money. <laughs> but that might not be God's will for your son. And so God will only answer our prayers when they are in line with what he thinks is best for us. That make sense? How many of you have said no to your kids because you didn't think it was good to say yes? Well, God has the right to say no when he doesn't think that a yes will be good for us. And um, on top of that, I am convinced that the great majority of fair and reasonable prayers that go unanswered 
is perhaps because they were prayed without faith in the first place and, and without a genuine hope that, that they will actually be answered. In other words, prayers that are spoken out without real expectation that God will actually answer our prayers. How many of you have prayed prayers like that? I think we all have. You know, we pray something and all we're doing is we're mouthing off words. In our heart, we, we don't really believe that God is going to answer them. Well, what effect do you think those prayers are going to have? Save our breath. Jesus said in Matthew 21, verse 22, you can pray for anything, and if you have faith, you'll receive it. Now, here's the key to having faith. Can we have faith when we're asking for something that deep down we know we shouldn't have? Is it possible to have faith for that? You know, we're mouthing it off, but deep down inside, we know that it's not right. So how can we have faith when we're asking for something that we know is not right? And so what Jesus says here, if you have faith, well, now we can only have faith in something if we believe what we're asking is right for us. Then, of course, we will receive it. Now, if Jesus says that we will get what we pray for in faith, then what do you think will happen when we pray without faith? Now, most Christians do have enough faith. In fact, they can't be Christians without faith. And so... They have it. You all have faith. If you're here today, even if you're here for the very first time and you've never been to a church before, you'll have some faith, and it was enough to get you here. The problem with many Christians' prayers is that they often lack the hope of getting them answered. Hebrews, 1, uh, Hebrews 11 verse 1 says, Faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things that we cannot see. Now, if you don't have hope that your prayer will be answered, then your prayer will lack faith. Not lack faith in God, who can answer your prayer, but a lack of faith in your prayer itself. Because faith is only the assurance that what we hope for will happen. And so having hope that your prayer will be answered will give your prayer the faith that it needs to attract God's attention. Hope and faith have a vital relationship that many Christians have missed when it comes to prayer. Let's get back to Revelation. There is no doubt that the idea of an angel taking an incense burner, you know, filled with incense and offering it along with the prayers of God's people on an altar before God is a bit odd to us who feel so free to pray any time. So should we go and buy some incense to help our prayers ascend to the very presence of God? I don't think so. Now these may be mysterious verses, but they do have a couple of lessons to teach us today. And first, the prayers of God's people, or the prayers of the saints, as the NIV uh, translation puts it, means that we're talking about your prayers, if Jesus is your Lord. Yes, it's true, you don't have to die to become a saint. You are already one. So don't hold back from living like one. Now, the prayers of saints do indeed reach God. As our prayers leave our hearts and our lips to ascend to the throne of grace, they're not just sent out into outer space to be forgotten. These verses show us that our prayers are not lost. Of course, as we noted a moment ago, there may be reasons why they don't get answered. It could be because they're prayed without hope or faith, or because the time to answer them is not right according to God. Or it could be because no is actually a valid answer. Lord, can I have this? No. <laughs> He's entitled to do that. Lord, I'm sick of my wife. Can I have a new one? No. Start loving her. And she will change. <laughs> Lord, I need a new husband. <laughs> Can I have a new husband? No, stop nagging and he will change. <laughs> Etc. Don't, sto don't throw stones at the truth. Now, in this case here, in the book of Revelation, I think that these prayers that the angel brought before God were unanswered prayers because the timing had not been right 
for them to be answered. But now the time was right. And so the angel brings them to God to be answered. They were not forgotten prayers. They were just unanswered prayers. This is an encouragement for us who are waiting still on unanswered prayers. These prayers this angel now brings to God as an offering were the prayers of the martyrs mentioned back in chapter 6, verse 10. Let's read that again. They shouted to the Lord and said, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you judge the people who belong to this world and avenge our blood for what they have done to us? It seems the time to answer the cry of the slaughtered martyrs throughout Christian history has come. Like these saints waiting on God to avenge them, we too may have prayers waiting to be acted on by God. It doesn't mean that He won't, just because He hasn't yet. Any day when the timing is right, your prayers on hold can come before God because finally the time for them to be answered has come. Now, if you have problems with prayer, let me assure you that you're not alone. You know, many Christians do from time to time, um, and some have always had problems. There are no diplomas in prayer. You know, there are no experts in prayer. We may struggle in this arena of prayer, but if we're saved and Jesus is our Lord, then we need to remember that we do have access to power from God through our prayers. And we also need to remember that even if we don't get our prayers right, or if we don't know how to say them the right way, we have an advocate in heaven to help us get it right with God the Father. The Apostle John said earlier in this letter of 1 John in chapter 2, verse 1, he said this, My dear children, I am writing this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. How awesome is that? How awesome that even though Jesus did the unbelievable, died on the cross for us, for our sake, He is still looking out for us. He's still in heaven now, watching out for us, interceding for us, pleading our case for us. When we stuff up, it's not instant, you know, strike, or, you know, strike one, two, and three, you're out. No, Jesus is there. You know, helping us to get through our situations. An advocate is a lawyer. Someone who argues a case for um, his client. And we have one such advocate interceding and pleading our cause in heaven. But wait, there's more. We also have an advocate here on earth who is, um, you know, here to help us when we need help. We have this advocate in our hearts Jesus told us that while he was going to heaven to be our advocate there, the Father would send us an advocate to be with us on earth. And he says this in John 14, 15 to 17. If you love me, obey my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. Hallelujah. Now the word for advocate in John uh, in 1 John 2, 1 and in John 14, 15 is the same original Greek word, which is parakletos. And it means an intercessor, a consoler, an advocate, a comforter, which is why some translations use the word comforter uh, or helper to describe the Holy Spirit. In any case, we have one member of the Godhead pleading our cause in heaven, and we have one member of the Godhead pleading God's cause in our hearts here on earth. And that's why you and I have power in our prayers. Amen. Our praying may seem weak uh, and ineffective at times, but nonetheless, the Spirit of God takes them and offers them to the Lord Jesus. And then the Lord Jesus takes them and offers them up to God the Father. And when He hears our prayers, they are powerful force yes. that He can use for His glory. If, of course, they have been prayed with hope and faith, in the first place. Now, after the angel with the incense uh, offered 
God the prayers of the martyrs, he does something strange, and what he does becomes the beginning of the answer to the martyrs' prayers. Let's go to verse 5. Then the angel filled the incense burner with fire from the altar, and he threw it down upon the earth, and thunder crashed, lightning flashed, and there was a terrible earthquake. Hey, haven't we heard this before? Haven't we heard about a terrible earthquake before? Well, yes, we have. And I remind you that this book is not written in chronological order, or I should say that you know, the vision that John saw may not have been in chronological order. Or his recording of the vision may not have been in chronological order. I mean, you've got to understand what was going on. John was seeing all of this with his eyes as if he was there, and then he's recording it for us. Not an easy task. Now, sometimes we are seeing through John's eyes the same event happening from a different angle or a different camera view. And I think God knew that we needed to see these events more than just once so that we can get a grip on what really will happen in the end times. You know, if we, if we get through this book and still lack motivation to preach the gospel to our friends and neighbors and people we know, there's got to be something wrong with us. And what will be wrong with us is a genuine lack of love for those people. Because if this is what they're going to be facing, if what we're reading through this book is what, we're going to, what they're going to be facing, would we not be motivated to do something about it? To try to save their... I was going to say something I want. <laughs> to save their lives. Now, we like to think of God only as a loving and gracious God who is eternally patient and long-suffering and who would never dare hurt his creation. And many preachers will preach that, thinking that that is what's going to win people to God. But you know what? People are too smart. People actually are smarter than that. People do not need us to portray God as a wishy-washy, mushy, you know, feel-good God. They're not interested in that. Do you know the greatest revival that hit America was after those planes crashed into the, into the, um, in, into the World Trade Center? And it wasn't a Christian revival. You know what happened? The churches that week were filled. People standing along the walls, back to back, shoulder to shoulder. And you know what those preachers preached when they saw their churches suddenly full of heathens? People looking for answers? They preached a wishy-washy gospel. And the next week nobody was there. But Islam multiplied in the U.S. You know why? Because people were thinking, if those people are crazy enough to, to, to fly a plane into an airplane, then they must really believe what they believe, and therefore what they believe must be true. That was the reaction. See, people are not looking for a wishy-washy God. They're looking for the truth. And the truth is that God is not wishy-washy. Now, we might try to preach him that way. We might try to make him out into a big, warm, fuzzy ball. But this is wishful thinking, and it is not at all biblical. For years, people have rejected God's love. They have rejected his ways, his word, his input, and his grace. They have even rejected his saving grace of his darling son, Jesus. And so there is nothing left for the God-haters but the eventual wrath and judgment of an offended God. And that's what we're about to see again as the angels start sounding their trumpets and judgment falls on the earth. Let's read on from verse 6 and see what happens um, after the first trumpet is uh, blown. Then the seven angels with the seven trumpets prepared to blow their mighty blast. The first angel blew his trumpet and hail and fire mixed with blood were thrown down on the earth. One third of the earth was set on fire. One third of the trees were burned and all the green grass was burned. We're not talking one third of Australia. We're talking one third of the world. Now, I guess we can call this first trumpet the trumpet of devastation. That's usually what great earthquakes and falling meteorites cause. The first trumpet brings hail and fire mingled with blood. Not sure what that means, but it doesn't sound good. 
Let's remember that John was seeing in his vision things that, 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 that he'd never seen before, things that were even hard for him to imagine, and thus he may have struggled to describe what he was seeing, but still we get a good idea of what was happening. This may be a description of hail falling from the skies mingled with lava from volcanic eruptions that could accompany uh, any great earthquake. Whatever the nature of this judgment, uh, this storm of wrath falls upon the earth and it burns up one-third of all the trees on the earth along with all the grasses. One-third of the trees, but all the grasses. So that, that heat generated by just one-third of the world um, on fire affected the whole world and so as a result of this judgment oxygen levels plummet and the quality of breathable air suffers greatly now if we think that the the uh, the air in the chinese city of beijing is bad it's nothing compared to what a third of the earth on fire will cause the word trees includes all the fruit trees and the word grass includes uh, wheat and all of the other grass-like grains and crops this fire will also impact the grazing grasses that livestock need to feed on. And so with one-third of all this burnt out, it will heavily impact the world's food supplies. Here we see the start of a time of great geological, e ecological, um, and economical disaster. The second trumpet can be described as a trumpet of uh, destruction. When the second trumpet sounds, a fiery mountain is seen falling into the sea. One-third of the sea is contaminated. One-third of all of the marine life dies, and one-third of all human ships are destroyed. Let's uh, read, um, you know, verse 8 and 9. It's, it's all good news, isn't it? No, not really. You're not kidding. Then the second angel blew his trumpet, and a great mountain of fire was thrown into the sea. One-third of the water in the sea became blood. One-third of all living in the sea died, and one-third of all the ships on the sea were destroyed. This could be a description of a large meteor falling out of space and hitting the oceans. And if that were to happen, it could easily destroy one-third of all life in the sea, and this would contaminate the oceans with dead, rotting bodies of marine life. It would also trigger massive tidal waves or tsunamis that would sink great numbers of ships. Their rusting hulks will choke shipping lanes and hinder the movements of men and materials and supplies. Many nations and mankind itself is very dependent upon the resources that we find in the sea. When the oceans are taken away as a source of life and livelihood, men will suffer from resulting massive economic disaster. The next trumpet can be called the trumpet of death. Let's go to verse 10 and 11 and see what this trumpet signals. Then the third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from the sky, burning like a torch. It fell on one-third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star was bitterness. It made one-third of the water bitter, and many people died from drinking the bitter water. Looks like another object falls from heaven. It's probably a comet, uh, since it's described as, you know, burning like a torch. The comet may break up on entry, and, and it gets scattered into various natural fountains of fresh water, and it causes them to become poisoned with, you know, whatever alien chemicals or dust that may have been attached to that comet. In any case, we see that one-third of the sweet, fresh waters of the earth are poisoned, and many die from drinking these tainted waters. Why would you drink tainted water? Why would you drink bitter water? Because you've got nothing else. Because everything's burning around you. The next trumpet can be called the trumpet of darkness. When the fourth trumpet sounds, it seems that God does what no one ever expected, and, and, and that is that he tampers with the solar system. He turns down the power of the sun, moon, and stars. Let's go to verse 12. Then the fourth angel blew his trumpet, and one-third of the sun was struck, and one-third of the moon, and one-third of the stars, and they became dark, and one-third of the day was dark, and also one-third of the night. The light from the sun and the moon and the stars is reduced by a third. They're dimmed and, 
and, and, and, and, and so when they, when they do shine, they're, they're just not as bright as they used to be. And they don't shine for as long as they used to. And so the light of the days in Australia, for example, will be shortened from an average that we have now of 14 hours of daylight per day, reduced down to about nine hours. And this could be the result of all the ash and debris from the earlier judgments, or it could be the supernatural hand of God actually striking the sun, the moon, and the stars. I mean, if He created the sun, He can, he can mess with it. However, the results are the same. The, the earth is plunged into darkness as the sun, moon, and stars refuse to give the light as they used to. This will affect growing seasons, weather patterns, plant life, temperatures on the earth, and mankind's physical and emotional health. This trumpet will take a great toll on all of humanity. Since the beginning of time, man has taken God for granted. You know, man has ignored him, blasphemed him, and lived as though he didn't exist. And many who claim to believe in him have uh, decided to, to fashion their own God into who they want him to be so that they can better tolerate him. Man has also taken God's creation for granted. There have always been plenty of trees and green grass. There's always been plenty of oxygen to breathe. The sea has always been there and, and it's always yielded its, its bounty to man as he sailed and, and fished its waters. There's always been plenty of fresh water to drink. Just go to any tap in your home and with just a quick twist, out comes lots of water. The sun, moon, and stars have always been in their place and they've always given their light. During the tribulation, God will take away what mankind has always taken for granted. Time is coming when mankind will see another side of God and then man will be judged for his refusal to bow before God and acknowledge his lordship. All the arrogant God-haters are in for a huge surprise. And it won't be good. Four trumpets have been sounded and it's all really bad news. Can it get any worse? People might be thinking. But then comes verse 13 and with it a warning of worse to come. This chapter 8 closes with an eagle-like angel flying through heaven pronouncing further woes upon the earth. Things are bad, but not as bad as they will become. The worst part of the tribulation still lies ahead. Let's read it. Then I looked and I heard a single eagle crying loudly as it flew through the air, terror, terror, terror to all who belong to this world because of what will happen when the last three angels blow their trumpets. Far out. Now if you've, ever, if you've never been saved, then today would be a good time to do something about that. If you have been saved, then this would be a good time to rejoice that you're going to miss these events. We look at these things and ask, how could this ever happen? Well, it will happen just as God says it will. You see, so far the Bible has been 100% correct. Out of the 2,500 prophecies found in the Bible, 2,000 of them have been fulfilled to the letter. And so why should we doubt that the remaining 500 aren't going to happen the same way. It's madness if you think that. A time is coming, and I believe it's coming soon, when the world will realize that God has just had enough. Enough of, you know, behaving, um, and enough of our behaving like our own gods and doing things like demanding um, that what he says is sin in his eyes is not sin in our eyes. You know? Do you realize that that's what the world's doing now? They're correcting God? They're making out that He's wrong and we're right? This is going to come to an end. The day is coming when God will reveal a side of His temperament that we have not seen since the days of Noah's flood. Days the world has either forgotten or refuses to believe in in the first place. God said He will do this in one of those remaining 500 prophecies that are yet to be fulfilled. And let me just read one example from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 38, 22 and 23. I will punish you and your armies with disease and bloodshed. I will send torrential rain, hailstorms, 
fire and burning sulfur in this way, I will show my greatness and holiness, and I will make myself known to all the nations of the world. Then they will know that I am the Lord. God will prove his glory in the day of his judgment. He will do things that we've read in these verses to show man just who God is. Today, mankind possesses the power to literally destroy the world. And so it's possible that in addition to all of these natural disasters, that God could actually use nuclear explosions to accomplish some of these things. I mean, right now, something crazy could happen. You've been watching the news, what's going on in the Middle East? You know, China is sending warships there. What the heck for? What do they got to do with the price of... You know, we got protests everywhere. We got America saying we're going to stick with Israel no matter what. We got the rest of the world against Israel. You know, I mean, things could go bad. We got the Ukraine stirring up trouble with Russia. You know, I mean, you know, people are talking about World War III. Well, how did World War II start? How did World War I start? How's World War III going to start? We don't know. Too many nations already possess nuclear weapons, and while in the past we could trust America to be a sort of deterrent or kind of peacekeeper, well, we can no longer trust them for that because their government has gone completely bonkers. There's more that could be said, but the bottom line is this. God's season of grace is coming to an end. It's coming to a close and judgment will be coming upon this earth and upon all who have rejected Jesus and refused to accept him as their savior. Is this me or you guys? No, it's it's really easy to talk whenever it's... All right. Well, Robin, can you bring me that other mic? I'll just swap. It doesn't matter. I'm nearly finished. Can I have the team up, please? You know, it's my hope that everyone here is certain that they are saved. If anyone isn't, then you can become certain today by just simply inviting God to become involved in your life as your Lord and your Savior. And if you're online, you can do this easily. The best thing you can do today is to be saved by His grace and be ready to meet Him when He comes to get His church so that you can avoid the tragedies that are coming. Because, folks, there's no way that I believe that the judgment of God is for his people. It's for those who have rejected him. And so if you become one of his people, you will be spared. Next week, we're going to look at what terrible terror this eagle-like angel was talking about. And so don't miss it. I'm guessing it'll be more doom and gloom, and I'm sorry about that. But... But God has promised that we will be blessed if we continue with this book. Amen. How many of you want to be blessed? I want to be blessed, so let's persevere. And, uh, and if you're ready uh, to accept Jesus as your Lord, then as we sing the song, just come. I'll gladly pray for you. If anyone has any other needs, uh, we can pray with you about them. Just come as we sing. All of God's people said, Amen, Amen indeed.